Echo Yoshva Chabatzela Tasharon. This is a, a, a kina. This is a kina that focuses on the fact that throughout the the temple period, throughout the temple period, we had kohanim. The appropriate way for kohanim to function, the appropriate way for kohanim to function would be that they would act as spiritual guides to the people of Israel, where they tell them that the priority is not the wealth, the priority is not the honor, but a Jewish priority is connecting to the higher being, and this higher being wants justice and righteousness. That's in its ideal form. And due to the fact that Kohanim were not working in the temple every single week, but rather there was a rotation, the rotation that was established that there should be 24 families of Kohanim. So Kohanim settled in different areas throughout the land. This is how this following kina is understood. And this, this kina makes reference to the fact that the beauty of service, the beauty of what the Kohanim did, was all lost with the destruction. Okay? Now, when, when you make such a statement, the first question you ask is, number one, what, what do you mean the, the beauty we lost with the Kohanim? We just learned earlier that the, the Kohanim were not exactly acting in the most righteous of ways. Uh, they were enjoyed the power. They were the upper class. Uh, positions were not given based on merits not what you know, but who you know and what your connections are. So how on earth can you go ahead and claim that they lost what the Kohanim had to offer? So there's a, there's a rule, there's a rule that uh, the, the, the Nitziv, Naftali Tzvi Yudah Berlin notes as well, that when we talk about Tishabov and we talk about the destruction of, destru the, destruction of the Beis Hamikdash itself, the Beis Hamikdash at the time of destruction was a shell. It was a shell. Why was it a shell? Because the Beis Hamikdash and a temple has value when it's used correctly. When it unites us, when we feel that it guides us, when we use it correctly. But when we start using Jewish concepts as an Avodah Zorah in essence, meaning it becomes a temple like any other temple, it becomes a hub of power, it becomes a source of corruption. So you know what? It's a shell. The temple is a shell. And the destruction itself, the destruction itself really occurred earlier. Meaning Tisha B'Av were mourning, yes, but the, what we mourn is those things that led to Tisha B'Av. And it's noted that Tammuz, the month of Tammuz, it's a very odd name for a month, by the way, and Tammuz, believe it or not, was actually a form of an Avodah Zarah. And the fact that it became a Jewish month is one that, str that commentators struggle with. How did a name that in ancient Babylonia referred to some form of paganism become a Jewish month? So true, we understand that the months, the names of the months originated in Babylonia. Fine, that's okay if they're Parva names. But to go ahead and have a pagan name this is something that authorities struggle with. What it clearly indicates is that Tammuz is not, in essence, a good month. Right? Shiva Sarbat Tammuz occurred there. The majority of the three weeks are in Tammuz. And Tammuz has a harsher name because Tisha B'Av, the destruction of Tisha B'Av was more due to what led to it, meaning what, what made what made the temple a shell is what we mourn. What made the temple a shell? What made the temple, what made the Beis Amikdash a shell? Their behavior, right? The corruption. You know, there's a statement in the Talmud and Psachim where it talks about uh, uh, different families of Kohanim who charged high taxes and were corrupt and the Talmud tells us, Oy lan, woe to us to the from the house of Katrus. Woe to us from the house of Katrus. It was a family of Kohanim that simply were corrupt towards the end of the Second Temple period. And what's fascinating is I mentioned earlier that if you make your way in the old city 
to the bait asaruf to the burnt house, and you arrive in the house of Katrus, and how do we know it's the house of Katrus? Because they actually, they, um, power back on, good. So actually they have, uh, they found on some of the vessels in that house, they found the word Katrus, meaning the Talmud complained about a corrupt family, and archeologists find the house of one of that corrupt family, and it's a nice, luxurious house. And they were earning things not from selling things on Amazon, right? And not because they owned stock in airlines before a crash, they owned it because of corruption. So it was a shell. The base Amigdash was a shell, but in, in its ideal form, in its ideal form, Kohanim have a very special mission. The Kohanim are the educators, right? They were the ones that inspired people. And if the system worked well, they would inspire throughout the land of Israel. So what we have here in Kina Yud, Echo Yoshva Chavatzele Tasharon, is talking about those 24 families, okay? And it makes reference to diff different locations, right? And it talks about the Kohanim of Tsiporim, Tsiporim, which is Sipari in northern Israel. The Shul is in Sipari. And then it talks about the Kohanim in Beit Lechem. And it talks about actually, and if, if you, it, it's in alphabetic order. So if you could look to the word Vav, we're going to move forward to the letter Vav. And we're talking about the fact that the beauty of the Jewish nation just left them. Okay, we, we, were, we were like silver plated. That's how beautiful we were. But Vayetze Hadar, the beauty left of the um of a nation, Bakesef Nechpas, that were covered with silver. And what happened instead of the beauty of Torah? Usmuro, Eifer, Al Rosha Chipas. And instead of the beauty of the Torah and our values, what covers our hair? Eifer. There's a custom at weddings that the many have that they put on the Chosen's head on the location of Tfilin. They put a fair in the location of Pe'er instead of the crown of Tfilin, and therefore we don't wear Tfilin in the morning of Tisha B'av. They put a fair. Venerot nichbu, and the candles of the Beis Amigdash were extinguished. And umenora nichpat, it seems to be that the menorah fell, and it was on, on its face. The menorah was always the symbol for us after the destruction more than anything else. But the truth is, even during the time of the Beis HaMikdash, especially the second Beis HaMikdash, the menorah was the image of the temple, went back to the days of Zechariah. When we were exiled from Yerushalayim and taken to Rome, the Romans took great pride in their victory. They minted a coin of Judea Kapteva that they were able to capture Jerusalem. But the arch that was built only a few years after the destruction in the year 70, Engraved into it were Jewish slaves carrying the menorah. Many people uh, who visited Rome saw it. Uh, it, it. It is well known that in 1947, after uh, the United Nations voted for the partition of Palestine, which allowed the presence of a Jewish state, so the chief rabbi of Rome took the community there, and the community in Rome had a minhag that they never, ever walked under the arch. It was usur. It was like a violation of a, a very old Italian minig, and Jews, by the way, Jews were in uh, Italy, Jews were in Italy already from the time of the Churban, and perhaps beforehand, right? And many people who visited uh, Italian shuls, they know that we are familiar with Ashkenaz and Sfard. They actually have Minag Roma, Nusach Roma, which is different. Which is different, it's just probably even older. Nusach Roma. So the, ro the community, the Italian community had a tradition of never, never walking under the arch until that day in November, late November of 1947. So the chief rabbi brought the community together. He made a shechionu for the vote of partition and he walked under the arch and the whole uh, community followed him. This is an incredible story that indicated their uh, excitement for the fact. And the reason it was such a chesed 
is because many, many members of that community, perhaps I would, you know, perhaps 95%, I don't know the numbers, but these were all Holocaust survivors. And you can imi and just imagine the spirit of Holocaust survivors two years after the war, right? Two years after the war. You know, when, when you're young, two, three years is a long time. The older you get, two, three years is garnished. So here we are two and a half years after the war and they get the, the, the news of, uh, of the United Nations granting the Jews a right for a Jewish state. So imagine the chesed the rabbi did by showing the community that we have hope in the future. The menorah is in the arch, etched into it in Rome. And therefore, when we want to go ahead and express our, our, our loss and our pain for what's a, a happening with the destruction, umenora nichbes. But the theme of this kina, of kina number 10, the theme of Echa Yoshva Chabatzelot Sharon, has to do with locations. Okay? So it tells us here that you want to know why the destruction occurred, kipashu, because of the violations that occurred. Belechem ubepat, with lechem and with pat. There was a lot, there was bread in Jerusalem, there was wealth, but there were poor people in the lower city. And the people, people in the upper city were not always concerned about the people in the lower city. So therefore, there was the greatest violation was taking place with lechem and pat with bread. And as a result, how can we? expect a temple, a spiritual hub, when we're not following the spiritual teachings that originate in that hub. So therefore, as a result, Nil Kida, and as a result, the poet ends off here by telling us, you want to know what was captured? Yodfat, a city called Yodfat. Where is Yodfat? It's in northern Israel. What happened in Yodfat? Well, as mentioned, in the year 66, the Jews rebel against the Romans. They come obviously from the north and they attack first the Galil. The first villages that were attacked occur in 66. And eventually, they attack a city by the name of Yotfat. There was a siege around Yotfat. And the general, the general of, of, that, of that city, the general, was a person who originated from Yerushalayim by the name of Yosef ben Matityahu. Josephus. Josephus was the young general who fought against the Romans in Yotfat. According to his, the way he presents the story, and although there are some things that we question Josephus, this part perhaps not, uh, 50 people from the city were able to get out before the Romans destroyed it and burnt it to the ground. And when the Romans destroyed, they destroyed things. And the 50 were in a cave, according to Josephus. And they had a question, what do we do? Do we make our way out of the cave and surrender to the Romans and become perpetual slaves? Or perhaps we die as martyrs by killing one another. And they voted on the matter and they decided that they're going to kill one another. And they had lots. And everyone is thinking, wait a second, I've heard that story. That's the Metzala story, right? Perhaps it was done there as well, or according to archaeologists, it was done there as well. And Josephus was among the last two uh, who survived uh, this brutal type of exercise. And Josephus eventually convinces the other one that they're going to come out and surrender to the Romans. Josephus describes that when he came out of the cave in the year 67, as Yotfat was a, a, a pile of ashes, so he turns to Vespasian, Aspasianus, and he says to him, I'm out here not just to surrender, but to declare that I had a vision, and you're going to be one day. Uh, the Caesar, you're going to go ahead and be uh, the ruler of the Roman Empire. And it seems to be that Josephus had the ability to uh, uh, butter up an individual, and Aspasianus, Vespasian, actually let Josephus live, 
and he actually had him join him. And it is very possible that Vespasian knew that the next target is Jerusalem, and he knew very well that there were some brave fighters in the land of Israel, and he felt perhaps one of the insiders, and Yosef ben Matitya was an insider, perhaps he could assist in the process, and he did in some ways. Now, uh, Josephus eventually, as you know, be, uh, made his, after the destruction arrived, came to Rome, and he was sponsored by Vespasian, who became a Caesar, who became the, empo- uh, the emperor, and he recorded the history of the Jews, and he recorded the history of the destruction. And we have a tremendous amount of information from Josephus. You know, for example, if you ever travel in Masharim, there's a, a road there on the outskirts called Hachoma Hashlishit, the third wall. Why is a street called the third wall? Because when Josephus describes the siege of Jerusalem in the year, uh, starting in the year 68 through the year 70, he mentions that there were three walls, three protective walls. And the protective wall, the external one, was the Choma HaShlishit. And archeologists found by the street called Choma HaShlishit, a wall, and they found stones that were shot from a catapult, and they found arrowheads, and it was very, very clear that those things were there since the destruction of the city. So they named the street Achoma HaShlishit. All information that relates to how the Romans destroyed the city originates from Josephus. And as a result, when we mourn on the 17th of Tammuz, when we mourn on the 17th of Tammuz, the city that was breached, where was it breached? Well, actually, it was not the first wall that was breached and not the second wall, but rather the Temple Mount, the Temple Mount and the city where the majority of the Jews were inhabited, had what was known as a Choma HaRishona, the first wall. To breach through the first wall, the Romans needed to first take a fortress, right? The Antonia Fortress which was north of the Temple Mount, but it was actually northwest. The fortress itself was used by the, it was built by Hadrian. The Romans took it over, I think, in the, in the beginning of the Common Era on the year six, and that gave them full control of the temple because the fortress had a complete view of what was taking place in the temple. And if there was anything that was irregular, the next thing the Kohanim would face were Roman soldiers. But during the rebellion, which started in the year 66, the Jews got rid of the Romans from the fortress. They controlled the fortress. And by controlling the fortress, they controlled the temple and the city. So for the Romans to conquer the city, they had to breach the fortress. That occurred, says Josephus, on the 17th of Tammuz. So Shiva Sarbatamas was not just the breach of a city, it was the breach of the fortress that led to the fall. And afterwards, we, we are told that on Shiva Sarbatamas, Butla Hatomin, on the 17th of Tammuz, they were no longer able to bring the daily offering. It suddenly makes a lot of sense because this was the fortress that protected the temple. As long as Jews have control of the fortress, activities in the temple could continue. Once it fell, everything ceased in the temple. So Yotfot that is mentioned here is actually a city that fell with Josephus. Now, as we talk about the cities that are mentioned here, they appear to be all in the north, right? Yotfot, Sfat, Tsipori. Were Kohanim really living in the north? So uh, Frank Mayer mentioned that he remembers from a few years ago that I talked about this that one way of understanding it is perhaps Kohanim lived throughout Israel, but there's difficulty there because they did work in the Beis Hamikdash, and, they, and we do know that many of those large, beautiful houses in Yerushalayim in the upper city were of Kohanim. It's hard to believe that they were dispersed throughout the land. And if, as Josephus tells us, he himself did not originate in Yotfat, right? He originated in Jerusalem, indicating that Kohanim in general were in Jerusalem. So there's a theory that's presented that this kino, Echo Yoshua Chavatzelis Sharon, how is it that the beautiful rose, 
the beautiful rose, the Chavatzel Sharon, sat alone, all alone. And as a result, the, the, the song, Damam Ron Mepino Se Aron, the song from the carriers of the Aron, the Levim cease. How did that all happen? So obviously it's describing here a destruction of Churban, but there are those who argue that the Churban that is being described here is not the Churban based Hamigdash, but the Churban that occurred in the seventh century. In the seventh century, there was a Churban in Eretz Yisrael. And although communities, in other words, Eretz Yisrael was in a decline, decline after decline after decline. The first decline is the Churban based Hamigdash. Afterwards, as we're going to discuss uh, some 60 years later, between the year 132 and 136, there was another rebellion against the Romans, the Bar Kokhva rebellion, another decline for the land. Eventually, they moved to northern Israel, and yeshivot exist there, the north. And by the way, when we talk about northern Israel, the Galil, the Golan is an integral part of historical Israel. They found dozens and dozens of shuls in the Golan. Rabbi Lazara Kapar, who was one of the uh, one of the authorities mentioned in the Talmud, they found his Bet Midrash in the in the Golan. And northern Israel, around Tveria, it became it became the the hub. It became the hub of Jewish presence. And as the rabbis tell us, that why is Tveria called Tveria? Because it's the tabor. It's the navel, it's the belly button, it's the core, it's the center of Eretz Yisrael. And this is a statement that was deeply, deeply felt during the years after the Bar Kokhva rebellion, when they did not have access to Yerushalayim. They did not have access to Yerushalayim, but Tveria became that hub. And therefore, when it comes to Talmudic sources, yes, you're going to read about Sipori being imp important, because that's where Rebbe edited the Mishnah. You're going to read about Bet Sha'arim because Rabbi originated there. You're going to read about Tveria because Rabbi Yochanan, Rishlak, everyone lived in Tveria. Israel, northern Israel became the hub. Now, eventually, unfortunately, uh, as, as the, 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 the land is uh, conquered, the land goes through different periods. By the way, one of the greatest periods during that era is when, was when the Persians controlled Israel. In the early 17th, 7th century, the Persians controlled the land of Israel, and they were very good to the Jews. The Persians historically were quite good to the Jews. And sometimes I feel that when I go to Young Street, that Persians are very, you know, they're nice people. The guy that changes my money on Young, a very nice individual, and he, he hates the Ayatollahs as much as we do, if not more, probably much more. And the Persians, I mean, if you talk about, uh, you know, is Israel, you know, El Al before the, the 79 revolution, uh, there were daily flights from Tehran to Tel Aviv, and uh, Jews were very, very comfortable, too comfortable, unfortunately, as we know. But uh, the Persian Empire actually uh, assisted, uh, wanted to even assist, according to some historians, with the rebuilding of Yerushalayim in the early 7th century. And uh, a few years ago, about eight years ago, there was uh, uh, paid for by some, one of the local organizations where there was a, 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 an etching of, I think, Nebuchadnezzar or of, or of Axursis, of Ahasuerus and of um, one of the, who was Ahmedijad perhaps. And they compared the two. In other words, there was some kind of publication in one of the Toronto newspapers where they were saying that Ahmadinejad is basically the old exorcist, which perhaps wasn't the smartest thing to do because why agitate the Persian community in their history, right? We're hoping for some kind of revolution in Persia and puts an end to the mullahs and, should, and the society there, I think, will be uh, quite good to Israel. So we have to be careful not to agitate them. And this is just an historical fact I'm throwing out that during that brutal period of the seventh century, there were some people that were good. And we remember, we Jews have good memories, right? We remember those who are good to us. Even those who weren't so good to us, we remember as good, like Roosevelt and Truman, right? Hakara Satov we have, because that's our essence. Yehudim are about Hoda'ah. So in the seventh century afterwards, and I don't know the exact year, I think it was year 638 perhaps, there was a tremendous Chorban in Eretz Yisrael, a destruction. The destruction was to such an extent 
that there was no community left there. Basically no community. To, to, and believe it or not, when by the 10th century, there's a little bit of return. Some Jews are returning there. They did not even know, they, they, the old customs of Eretz Yisrael simply vanished. You know, for example, if you would vintage, visit one of the tiny communities in Israel in the 8th or the 9th century, Rosh Hashanah was only one day. Rosh Hashanah was one day. Only afterwards, in the 11th century, when we had disciples, Rabbi Yitzchak El Fasi, arriving, did they declare, no, no, you should keep two. So the minhag, there was such a small community that minhagim simply vanished. Churban Eretz Yisrael of the 7th century is perhaps what is being referred to here. And when it talks about the cities of Meron that got destroyed, and it talks about the city of Tsipori that got destroyed, and it talks about the city of Yotfat that got destroyed, according to this approach, it's referring to cities that were inhabited in the 7th century because there were thriving communities from the second century on in northern Israel. That was the hub. That was destroyed. And that is a churban that we mourn. Uh, we mourn it, but we always keep a link. The Rambam shares with us a tradition that Moshiach, that Moshiach is actually going to, or the Sanhedrin is going to meet before the coming of Mashiach in Tveria. In other words, Tveria is viewed as a stepping stone for the return to Yerushalayim. And uh, sometimes I have a desire of maybe buying a real, uh, an apartment in Tveria. I want to be there when the activity starts. And it's cheaper than Yerushalayim Tveria. So perhaps something will do one day. But the Tveria is a very significant part because our detachment from Eretz Yisrael in the 7th century occurred from Tveria. That was the hub. That was the center. Our return is going to be a return starting in some ways, at least spiritually with Tveria. Baruch Hashem, we've merited to see a rebuilding of the land. And Baruch Hashem, as Ramosha Feinstein says, Yerushalayim is Bnuya Tiferet. It's a built city. But that's physically. We're waiting for a spiritual return. And that destruction that brought about the Churban of the 7th century is perhaps what is referred to in this kina. I'll give everyone a minute or two to read the kina of Yud, and then we'll move on to the next, to the next one. In the, there was a righteous king in Yerushalayim by the name of Yoshiao. He was extremely righteous. As a young child, he came to power, really. And this was a nation where wor the worship of Hashem was uprooted by King Menashe, his predecessor. And Yoshiao wants to reestablish the service of Hashem, and he starts off by bringing the Korban Pesach, we are told. Okay? And th this was a very uplifting experience because Yoshio decides that for us to survive spiritually, we have to uproot Avodah Zarah from the land of Israel. And we always talk about Avodah Zarah. Avodah Zarah is not just wrong, it's destructive. It's destructive. And for example, there was an Avodah Zarah called the Molech. Are you familiar with, uh, with the Avodah Zarah of the Molech? The Avodah Zarah of the Molech would be to offer children to this pagan force and pagan image and burn the child in fire. Okay. Now, 
it, it's they found Af uh, somewhere in Africa, I don't remember where, they found somewhere in Africa uh, a type of worship that archaeologists found in earthenware, uh, in earthenware vessels, remains of thousands and thousands of children. And obviously they were, the, the, the bones were organized neatly because it was part of a pagan service, the Moloch. And the, these African primitive services to be done in Yerushalayim, like think about it, think about it. We are the first, furthest thing from uh, ancient African practices and ancient African culture, which would be, yes, human sacrifices, and yes, drinking blood to go to war. That was the practice of these cultures, right? There's no question about it. And to bring to Yerushalayim, and we even know where it was, by the way, there is a place that is not far from the King David Hotel, nothing, nothing to do with the King David Hotel, but there's a place called Gei Ben Hanom, Gei Ben Hanom, where there's a tradition that the, egg, the entry to Gehenna is there. Many of the Hebra Kaddishas, when they transport bodies by Gei Ben Hanom, they move fast. And I think that the reason it is associated with Gehenna is that the greatest Gehenna is for us Jews, us Jews, who are supposed to be the light upon the nations, to take practices from the, the, the lowest of nations, right? And human sacrifice and offering children to satisfy a God is the furthest thing from Judaism. And to go ahead and bring it to Yerushalayim, that's Gehenna. And therefore, because we know for a fact from Tanakh, that those services occurred in Geb Ben Hanom. That's why we don't want to spend time there. That's the Gehenna. And King Menashe gets all the credit. You know, I think it was a period of 52 years that he simply ran the country spiritually into the ground. So imagine to rebuild after such a Khurban. Yoshio does it. Okay, Yoshio does it. And Yoshio uproots Avodah Zarah, in his mind, it was completely successful. It was completely successful. Yoshio was able to do it. Uh, but the problem is that uh, old habits, you know, die hard. And there were those that were extremely from and very committed to their uh, old practices of Avodah Zarah. And they concealed it from government officials who were basically involved in uprooting Avodah Zarah. Yoshio was not aware of it, and therefore he thought that all the blessings of the Almighty will be bestowed upon the people of Israel at this point, because we are Avodah Zara free. A point came when the Egyptian king wanted to make his way through the land of Israel, okay, and... Yoshio says to him, listen, I'm not going to let you travel through my land because when we fulfill the will of God, we have a guarantee that not just we will not be in war, but rather, there's not going to be any, any sword passing through our land. Okay. So Yoshio tried to prevent this Egyptian king, Pharaoh Nechev, from making his way through the land of Israel. Unfortunately, we are the... He dies. Righteous Yoshio dies in the battlefield. And he was hit with uh, 300 spears. The loss of Yoshio was extremely devastating. That was the beginning of the downfall because they lost this righteous king who inspired them. And we, it says in Divrei Hayomim, Vayikonen. Yermio al Yishioshio. Yermio the prophet went ahead and he mourned and he eulogized King Yoshio. Okay. And he established, we are told, that it should be It became a chok, it became a law. It became a law that we always must commemorate Yoshio. When we talk about a destruction, and for us Jews, a destruction originates in the fact that we are not guided spiritually, that we are corrupt, that we are not just, that we worship these ab absurd pagan forces. When we lose a Yoshio, we have to remember that we need such people, right? And the world is uh, not such a good place because we don't have that leadership. 
And therefore, Vaikonen your Miyoyo Shio, which is Kina 11, it is a chok. We are fulfilling here what Yermia established 2,600 years ago that we should remember him. And therefore, it's a very important Kina. Echa Eli Konenume Elov. Okay. Ben Shmone Shana Echali Drosh Melahav. In other words, you want to know from what age. And this is, you know, Shio grows up in a culture that, that, Jewish values, Torah commitment, all was not existent. Menashe uprooted it completely. Menashe could, took control of the de- Department of Education. And if you control the curriculum, you control the future. And therefore, he controlled the future. Judaism, there was no knowledge of it. But as an eight year old, Yoshio starts seeking out. Now, that is righteousness, but the problem was that B'nai Cham. The children of Ham, which refers to Pharaoh, be Avram, as they were passing through the land of Israel, Chanualav. What? They parked in front of him, meaning they wanted to make their way through the land of Israel. And the problem was, Yoshio was not aware of the fact that he had many righteousness, he had many righteous merits. Velohuskarlo, Sigui Mifalav. Unfortunately, the Almighty did not remember all his credits when this tragedy was occurring. Now you should know, we are told, Vigam, you should know a little bit about Yoshio. Vigam bechol malchei Israel asher kamu ligdor, when it comes to all the kings of Israel who came to put up fences to protect us spiritually, guess what? Lokam kamahu, there was not one person like him, miyemot avigdor, from the days of avigdor. Who's avigdor? Moshe Rabbeinu. He was it. But the problem was that there were some lightheaded people that simply wanted to keep Avodah Zarah part of their lifestyle. And therefore, Davak, Bo, you know what clinged, clinged to Yoshio that brought about the destruction? Davak, Bo, the Chet, the sin of Letzanei Hador, of the comics, right? Of the Letzanim, the clowns. Clowns who don't take anything seriously. It's nice to make... A joke here and there to uplift the spirit, but it's terrible to make a joke to laugh at the essence of a spirit, right? Asher kamu acharadelet lisgor. You know, behind the door, they concealed avodah zarah. According to some, they made avodah zarah of two parts that when the door would close, it would appear, right? Now, the Egyptians who eat black seeds, Egyptian beans, ha-mitzrim, right? Ha-ochlim zera shichor. They unfortunately kitmu hatov pichamu mishachor. They made him look black, okay. And vaygdal avon veheshiv yaminachor. You should know that th- this uh, th- th- this decree was one that was due to sin. Brought his right hand back. Vaodlo shalach adominachor. Right. In other words, he wasn't able to get rid of the terrible decree. Zakua Marav, you should know that Yoshio was one that his teachings were full of merits because Kenam Dat Lehakim. In other words, he wanted to establish and solidify the Dat, the faith in Israel. And you should know, unfortunately, right, you know the story that Yoshio found the Sefer Torah. And when they brought the Sefer Torah in front of him, they opened it and it was a tremendous a presentation in front of the nation because when that text that they found, it was a lost Sefer Torah. Menashe got rid of all Sefer Torah. When they found that Sefer Torah, they opened it up on the words, Arur, Asher, Lo, Yakim. Okay? So therefore, it, it shook them up. Bitzayim Rato, so he committed his word, Be'arur, Asher, Lo, Yakim. He was able to rekindle, reestablish the faith after finding those words in the Torah. But unfortunately, when you realize that the nation is so far, and here's a description of how he went through the process of returning the nation to the proper path. In other words, he himself ripped his garments because he felt that we have to go ahead and change. So the kina itself, which I'm again going to let you uh, finish reading if you have the ability, but it describes. Yoshio's tremendous work 
on making Israel great again spiritually, okay? And unfortunately, the loss of such a person is something that we remember on Tisha B'Av as well. So I'll let you read it, and then we'll move on to the next. Many of the many of the kinot, many of the kinot are built on Eicha. And they describe the contrast of what how God Almighty promised the nation of Israel a whole series of blessings, and look what happened. And we'll do one of them before we move on through Jewish history. Number 18, it's Yudchet. It starts with the words Vata Amarta. Hey Tev, hey Tivimach. You know what? You know, you know, you God Almighty said that I'm going to do good for you. Veniflinu ani ve'amach, and we're going to be distinct. We're going to be special. The Jewish people are going to be special. But velama, but why is it that bnei beli al chilelu shemech? Why is it that people that were bli al? What are people bli al? The essence of a mature human being is the idea that you understand that you have responsibilities. You have response. We are born with responsibilities. When, uh, you know, here we talk about rights. Judaism talks about responsibilities. And a responsibility is not always fun, but it's the right thing to do. And you're fulfilling your purpose when you fulfill that responsibility. It is compared to a yoke. A yoke. A yoke. Um, I have not been on farms often. But I've seen pictures of the, the, the oxen that are with a yoke. And the yoke is called in ol, with an ein, in ol. And we always talk about the fact that as good Jews, we carry a yoke. And it doesn't mean that we walk around with our backs bended. But rather, it's a yoke with pride. It's an ol malchut shamaim that we take the yoke of heaven, that we carry something very important on our shoulders. We have a responsibility of living a specific way, of being sure that in the future, future generations live that way. We do it, but we do it with pride. I remember uh, sharing a few years ago that I found um, the great commentator of the Mishnah, Rabbi Israel Lifshitz, and he wrote, he, he wrote a commentary that is magnificent. We've studied it, I would say every, when we used to have Turkey Avot, every week we would study perhaps something from Rabbi Israel Lifshitz. And Rabbi Yisrael Lifshitz uses the word that you should know on his commentary in the Mishnah, that Judaism has an ol. Yes, it's a yoke, but it's a golden yoke. It's an ol shel zahav. So it was, a beautiful, it was a beautiful term that I really liked. And then eventually I decided to search if he's the first one that came up with it. So in Hebrew literature, I found no one else using it. So he was the first that introduced it to Hebrew. Ol ha-zahav. But then I found it in English. In Shakespeare. Shakespeare mentions the golden yoke. So either he got it from Shakespeare or they both thought the same. One or the other doesn't make really a difference because the message is we carry a yoke, but feel that it's gold, right? It's purpose, right? We're doing something meaningful. Now, a person that wants to walk around and feel that life is without yokes, he is bli ol, bli ol, without a yoke. And that's going to be a problem when a person feels zero responsibility. I can do what I want, right? It's a free land, right? You've seen any videos? Have you ever seen videos that uh, <clears throat> there are videos that you, you see sometimes online of people in the States, specifically in the South, who don't want to wear a mask in a supermarket, right? Because when I go to my Walmart and I pick up my Cheetos and my potato chips and my beer, it's a free country. No one's going to tell me to wear a mask, right? 
So that is bli all, a person who realizes that if there is indeed a benefit, a benefit medically for society, it's my responsibility to wear a mask. Yes, it's not completely comfortable, it's a little bit of an all, but that's life that you do what's right. <coughs> bli all, bli all, that's when we run into trouble. And therefore, <coughs> what we have here, our lama, we ask in Kaddish Baruch lama b'nei b'li al, People who have no yoke, they desecrated your name. And why did you not place your wrath upon them? There's a tremendous chilul Hashem. There's a desecration of God. When people that are evil succeed. When people who are evil succeed, and people who are good are not, people start questioning where is God. And we don't like that. We don't want that because that's a desecration of God. A Kiddush Hashem is when people who are righteous are successful, are happy, and success does not mean financial. Success means that they're calm, that they're happy, that they interact in a pleasant way, that they fulfill their obligation, they have a, a pleasant existence, they appreciate what a Kodesh Baruch Hu gave. That's a Kiddush Hashem, but when there's suffering of the righteous, it's a Chil Hashem. And when Bnei Belio, when people without a yoke are successful and they are able to destroy the Beis Hamikdash, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not pour his wrath upon them, this is something that we question. And we contrast it because Atagidalta veRomamta banim you know, you HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you raised in the land of Israel and you gave them the ability, you know, to get the nourishment from the land of Israel, an incredible, beautiful, special land. Just as right, the, the, the nursing mother carries the baby. But unfortunately, Lama Dodanim, why is it that they they Ishmaelim? That's Ulizanek, right? They jumped upon us. And also Arye Nebuchadnezzar Lechanek. We're des describing here events of the destruction of the first temple. I just want to mention that every year Tisha B'Av upstairs, if you remember, there was a Rabbi Yutkin who would come and speak from Kiryat Malachi, who is doing a nice job of tzedakah for young girls who have no homes. And it's a tremendous tzedakah that the shul participated every year. So this year, we don't have the opportunity of having him. And we don't have uh, Shapsi is, uh, I don't know if he's here or not. But you do, if you do have the ability to communicate with Shapsi, Adler, and uh, to go ahead and uh, give to that tzedakah. He's done it in the past. And I'm sure many of you in the past have given. So it's an opportunity to uh, do our traditional Tisha B'Av uh, tzedakah. Now, the Dodanim. So what we are referring to here is our path to Babylonia. And it talks about the fact that we had to deal with our Dodanim, our cousins. You know who our cousins are? Ishmaelim. And we have to deal with the Arya, the lion, because the Bukhanetra was compared to a lion. Now, who are the Dodanim? Who are the Dodanim? So there's a well-known Medrash that when the Israelites were exiled from Jerusalem after the destruction of the first temple, they passed through some Bedouin or Ishmaelim, descendants of Ishmael, and they saw the Jews suffering. And the Jews, Nebach, with desperation, turned to them and said, give us something, we're hungry, we're thirsty, please. Right? We're in desperate need. They were in chains, taken to Babylonia. So the Ishmaelim, according to the Medrash, first gave us, <clears throat> first gave us dried, salty, dried foods, fish or meat. And when, after eating them, we, our, our, our thirst increased tremendously. And they gave us uh, these pouches, which were filled with air. And the Jews took the pouches filled with air and it killed them. The air killed them, meaning they placed the Jews in a, in a situation of being completely desperate for water. And when you are desperate, you'll take something that is filled and just let it fill your lungs, not recognizing that it's not water, but rather air. Those are our dodanim that we are referred to here. And I always see it as a metaphor that sometimes when it comes to Bnei Ishmael, they make things desperate for us. 
and then we go ahead and think we are getting A, but we get B, right? Think we're getting water, but we get air. You think about the whole Oslo Accord. Yeah, you remember the Oslo Accord? That, uh, yes, the situation was not good. From 1987, there was an intifada, and there was a lack of security, and uh, terrible things occurred. And eventually, so then comes 1993, and we signed, signed a, a peace accord. So they basically put us in a corner to, to sell us, that guess what, we're willing to sell you peace. Meaning they made the, the salty fish were the stones and guns that they aimed towards us. And the, 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 the pouch that was filled with air was the agreement signed at the White House. Right, that's gonna be, bring an end to violence. No more blood, as the uh, Shikr uh, Rabin uh, said, no more blood, right? No more violence. Via Lochenkopf, like a hole in the head. It led to much more violence, right? And that's what happens when you are fooled, when you are put in a desperate situation, you make bad decisions. You think that the pouch is full of water, it's full of air, and it could kill you. But we go on with this contrast. Ata henakta, you are Kodesh Baruch who gave Klal Yisrael dvash misela, sweetness from the flint. And also, nozlim misel, and water from a flint. But now what happened was, unfortunately, when we were punished, v'lama shoftehem nishmetu sela. Why is it that our judges had hearts that were made out of rocks? V'olelehem, and therefore, if there's no justice, if those who have the power to impact others have hearts of stone, right? If that's what happens, unfortunately, olalehem nupatsu elasela. The brains of children were, were crushed on stones. And if this sounds some, like something ancient, something ancient from the destruction of the first temple in the year of 2,500 years ago, let's remember that this occurred also, unfortunately, 80 years ago by the Nazis, the brutality of the Nazis. Rav Soloveitchik was always note, would always note that anything he reads in a Midrash about the destruction of the temple occurred with the Nazis. And there's a Midrash that tells us that, the, the, that during the Khurban, when uh, the Romans and the Babylonians wanted to torture someone, they would tie their feet to the back of horses and make the horses run. And that's how, and the person would just die in a very gruesome way. And Rusalovetchik notes that he had a cousin in Varsha, that a few weeks after his wedding, the Nazis came to town and he was walking with his young wife and the Nazis grabbed them and tied them to a car and did the same to them. These are the Germans, right? The German culture, which we looked up to. And if I would interview any, any Jew, the most Orthodox Jew in Germany, right? German was something to take pride of, right? I'm German, you know, I'm, I'm from a better society. Look what a better society does when they don't have the values, when they're without the yoke of Torah. And that's our responsibility to remind ourselves and the world that if we do not see the divine image, the, 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 the Tselem Elohim in every single being, you turn, you know, look, look what happened. Look what happened to the righteous societies, right? Look what happens if you could have a Heidegger, but he's a Nazi, right? You could have the greatest of philosophers. That's what we are told about. Let's continue here. Ata zanachta vatimas kol goy. You know, Kodesh Baruch you rejected all other nations. Lakachta goy mekerev goy. And something incredible occurred. And this is, again, the contrast. He took us out of Egypt. Vilama, but why? Chashva alal artzigoy. Why is it that a nation came to my land? Ve'amru lechu ve'nakchidem egoy, and they declared, "We're going to uproot, we're going to destroy, we're going to put an end to the Jewish nation, to the Jewish problem." So many nations have said it, right? It's quite incredible to sit here on the Tisha B'av and remember attempt after attempt after attempt to destroy us, and look at us. Right, something to be very, very proud of. Atat tetata shishim You rejected sixty-eight nations. Right, 
Levi Shomer Emunim to bring a goy that Shomer Emunim Y68. Well, it could be that it is not counting Ishmael and Esav, or it could be that the 68 refers to Avraham's descendants, different explanations. But the main issue is, Why is it that the nations around us said negative things about us? And this is based on a Midrash, that they, when they entered into the Holy of Holies and they saw the Kruvim, they said very negative things about the Jewish people. I'll let you continue because we have a lot still to do. We're going to talk a little bit about the Asara Haruge Malchut, which is 21, which it starts off with the word Arzei HaLevanon Adirei Torah, these wise people of Israel, which were mighty in Torah, mighty in Torah. The 10 martyrs, the 10 martyrs, although the Midrash presents it as a tragic event that occurred at one time, it occurred over a history of time that we had righteous, incredible, Torah scholars who were leaders, true leaders of Klal Yisrael, concerned that Torah live on. And by the way, they succeeded. They succeeded. Our Judaism today is because of them, right? Without a Rabbi Akiva, we wouldn't have a Judaism today. So they are the greatest success story, the greatest success story. Imagine you have a, a, a vision, and 2,000 years later, people are living based on that vision. But unfortunately, we didn't merit to have them uh, live a life that they deserved. And with great brutality, the Roman Empire wiped them out as it wiped out the nation. And it occurred over an extended period of time, and it ended off with the Bar Kokhva Rebellion. Bar Kokhva, his real name was Bar Kosiba, a very dynamic, charismatic, and righteous individual. And his charisma was such that he was a true leader to such an extent that the rabbis, many of them believe that we're talking here about the Messiah. So this is a nation after the destruction of the temple in the year 70, in no way did the nation feel we are finished here. Those who remained believed that we're going to go ahead and rebuild. We're going to have that future temple. And there were Jews who were still present in Israel, and the spirit did not die. <clears throat> they were waiting for the right time, and that right time for them came in the year 132, where there was a rebellion, and this rebellion against the uh, Hadrian, against the Roman Empire, was led by Bar Kokhva, and it succeeded. They actually released, according to some Jerusalem at some point, and there are coins that were minted. They minted coins. They actually took Roman coins and minted upon them the freedom of Jerusalem. And it is interesting that archaeologists actually found uh, messages that were sent from the generals in the field to Bar Kokhva. And the, the generals in the field noted that what they asked for is to be sure that they get the Dalad Minim. They get the four Minim, the four species, before Sukkot. That's very, very interesting. On the Bar Kokhva coins, actually, on the Bar Kokhva coins, there are images of a Lulav and an Esrog, Hadas and Arava. But what's interesting is that there was only one Hadas and one Aravan, not the three and the two. And uh, my, my great uncle, Chaim Kolitz, had a theory that Bar Kokhva had a rabbi who supported him completely until the downfall. That rabbi was Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva and the Mishnah tells us that you should know that when it comes to the four species, just as you have one etrog and one lulav, you're supposed to have one hadas and one arava. So therefore the coins of Bar Kokhva follow the opinion of his teacher of Rabbi Akiva. So obviously there was a very strong relationship there. 
And although from Talmudic sources it would seem to be that only Rabbi Akiva was a follower, the Rambam believed that many rabbis followed and believed that Bar Kokhba is the Messiah, right? And perhaps when we read in the Talmud that Rabbi Akiva comforted the other rabbis and they said to him, Akiva nechamtano, Akiva, you've given us comfort. It is very possible that the comfort referred to is the comfort of that we have a Mashiach coming. Unfortunately, we were not worthy. And it brought about a destruction like no other destruction where the hub of this rebellion, Beitar, was wiped off the face of the earth. And there's a Roman, a Roman general, right, Dio Cassio. And Dio Cassio tells us that you should know that 580,000 men were slain in the various raids and battles, and the number of those that perished by famine, disease, and fire was past finding out. So the low count of how many people died as a result of the Romans crushing the rebellion, the low number was perhaps 600,000, a terrible Corban Teretz role. And after that, the South is gone. There's no longer a hope of Yerushalayim because Yerushalayim is off limits. Right? For, for decades upon decades, way over a century, Jews are not entering Yerushalayim. I think in Tisha B'Av they allowed them. There was actually, uh, in, in the 11th, I think 10th, 11th century, it's recorded that was, there was a minhag that on, I think it was Hoshana Rabbah, Jews would stand in Harazetim and say prayers facing Yerushalayim. And according to some historians, the reason there was a custom that developed to stand specifically as was in Harazetim was because for the many, many years after the Khurban of Betar and after the rebellion that failed, the rebellion of Bar Kochvia that failed, Jews were not given access to Yerushalayim. And therefore, the closest that they could get was Harazetim. So therefore, services developed on Harazetim, and it was something that remained. And Baruch Hashem, you know, with time, things changed. And uh, Baruch Hashem, eventually Jews did re-enter Yerushalayim, as you know, and the Kotel became that spiritual hub, became that spiritual hub. So Asara Harugei Malchut is what we're going to uh, study now a little bit. Arzei Alvanon, this is number 21. Right, Adirea Torah Baalei Trisin. They were holders of shields. Right, when Talmud tells us in Chagiga that Torah scholar, scholars are called holders of shields, and just as if you have a thesis, you have to defend it. If you want to argue a position in Talmud, you have to defend it. So they are Baalei Trisin, holders of shields. Bemishno Vigmara. Gibore Koach. They are very, very mighty. Amalea betahara, and they toil in Torah with purity, right? For the right reason, to get the truth, nothing but the truth. Unfortunately, damam nishpach, their blood spilled. Vinashta gvura, and their weakness, right? The weak, and Torah, the mightiness of Torah became weak. We never again had people on that level. Hinam Kedosha, and they are the holy Haruge Malchut Asara, the ten martyrs who were killed by the Roman government. The Al E Le Anibochia, and on Tishabav, when we commemorate the destruction and the destructions due to the destruction, we also think about the destruction of Torah. The Eni Nigrara, and tears follow one after another as I cry. Zot Bezochri, all this occurs as I remember. Is ak bimara, I'm going to cry out with bitterness. Chemdat Israel, the beauty of Israel. Kle hakodesh nezer vatara, they were like crowns. Tehore lev with pure hearts. Kedoshim metum bemita chamura. This was not just dying in in a a, a a a a way that's humane, quote unquote, but with great brutality were these people killed. Yadu Goral, now how did, how did they decide who goes first? Yadu Goral, they had a Goral, some lottery. Mi Rishon Lacherev Bura, who's going to be chosen? Chosen first for the sword. 
Kinpol Goral al Rabban Shimon, as the lot fell on Rab Shimon, Pashat Savaro Ubacha Kenig Zerag Zera. He cried out, right? He cried out. And Le Rabban Shimon Chazar Haigmon Le Hargo Benefesh Netsura, and he was killed. So he turned to Rabbi Shmael, the high priest, who was a descendant of Aharon. And Rabbi Shimon turns to Rabbi Shmael, who was Mizera Aharon Sha'al Bevakasha, Livkot al Benagvira. So it comes out that Rabbi Shmael was the one who asked the Caesar to cry over the loss of Rabbi Shimon. And he was able to take the head of Rabbi Shimon that was detached at this point, Natal Rosha. And he cried out and he said, You are like a pure light. Face to face. And he said, Whoa, a mouth that spoke words of Torah, right? The purpose of our existence. Givalt, look what happened. Look what happened to this holy mouth. And then, unfortunately, they decided to skin. The Midrash tells us that the daughter of the Caesar disliked the presence of Rabbi Shmuel and he was skinned. To be skinned alive is a mita, is a death, which is ex extremely painful and brutal. And therefore, Tsiva, he commanded, he commanded to go ahead and take a large blade and skin his head. In other words, it's as if a person says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and just take off your skin and your essence. Now we are told that when they reach the point of his tefillin, Rasha, Poshet, Et, Higia, Lemakom Tefillin, Mitzvat bara, the commandment that was given by God, sa'ak sa'akam and izdaza olam. He cried out. It continues here with the destruction of Rabbi Akiva and the fact that he was combed to death with heated iron combs. It talks about ba ben, ben Baba, Rabbi Yehuda ben Baba, that was killed also in a brutal way. Rabbi Hanina ben Tardion, which the Talmud also describes that he was burnt with a Sefer Torah. Ravi Shavav, he was killed and dogs dragged his body. Rav Chutzifas himself as well. Rav Lazar ben Shamua was pierced to death in Erev Shabbos. And this is what we read about. I'll give you a few seconds to read about if you turn to the text inside and then we'll continue. So we talked a little bit about the destruction of the first base Amigdash, which occurred on Tisha B'av. We talked a little bit about the Chorban of the second base Amigdash, which, although the majority of this structure burnt on the 10th of Av, uh, it, it caught fire really on Tisha B'av itself. We talked about the Chorban of Beitar, which took place. We talked a little bit about the Chorban of the seventh century. And we're going to move forward now to events that occurred with the First Crusade. The First Crusade, which here Christianity, right? Christianity reaches its, uh, its peak in some ways, right? It's shaky in the first few centuries, but it reaches its peak when eventually they decide, the Christians, that they're going to go ahead and free uh, Jerusalem and the tomb of Yashke from the infidels, from the Muslims. The Muslims conquered Eretz in the seventh century, in 638, and they had complete control of the land of Israel until 1099, 1099 when the Crusades arrived. We'll talk about that. Uh, they freed again in 1187. Eventually the Mamluks come in the 13th century. The Turks arrive in 1516, and then the Brits, Right, the Brits. We thought that the Brits come, everything will be good. They were the biggest disappointment, the Brits, and they arrived obviously 
uh, in World War, after World War I, now, 1917. What we're going to read now is a little bit about the destruction of the city of spires, worms, and mines, which is Kina 25, which is a well-known Kina of Mi Iten Roshi Maim. Oi, right? They should put, my whole head should be filled of tears. The Eini Mekor Nozli, my eyes should be a source of, of, of fluids coming out. The Efke Kol Yemosai Velela, I should really call, cry out all my days and nights. Es Chalalei Tapai Ve'olalai, those that were massacred, the children that were killed. And not just children, Yeshishai Kehalai, the elders of the community. Vatem Anu, Avoy Oi Ve'olalai, say Oi Ve'i. In other words, you becherav uh, In other words, due to the sword, cry out to this destruction of this city. As the Crusaders were inspired by Pope Urban, and this was taking place in November of 1095, and he said that whoever obeys this journey and affixes uh, the cross to his garment he has a guarantee of uh, reaching you know the, the the better world now they were led i mean we've studied in the past about godfrey and french communities that were right wiped out in the spring of 1096 Unfortunately, there's no record of the French communities that were uh, destroyed during that period of time. But we do have a record of the Chorban that occurred after Pesach and up until Shavuos in the German communities. And as a result, by the way, due to the fact that many of these destructions occurred starting Rosh Chodesh Iyar up until Shavuos, therefore the Ashkenazi old tradition was that the Omer period actually started Rosh Chodesh year on Tosh They didn't end at Lagba Omer. And also the Kelmo, you know, Kel, you know, the Kelmole Rachamim, right? And the Ov Rachamim that is said to commemorate them, we say it during the Sphira, even if it was a Shabbos that usually you don't, right? Ov Rachamim is not said when you have uh, Birkas HaChodesh, but during Sphira, yes, because that's when they wiped out these communities. And uh, unfortunately, the three core communities, which were centers of Torah, were wiped out. And that's what we're going to read about a little bit now. You know, my eyes should cry. I'm going to go to the field of crying. And let everyone who is, feels that bitterness cry with me because of the fact that there were Jews that did what? That were wiped out during that period of time. Okay. It makes reference, I'll let you read it, that the, the city of Worms was wiped out on the 23rd of ER. And you should know, and this is in, on the third month, the Kriyas Hallel, during the Hall of Shavuos, they wiped out the rest of their community. This was a, 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 a shreklach, a terrible event that occurred. And by the way, when we talk about the Crusades, yes, we focus more on the first crusade, which according uh, to Gretz, 12,000 Jews died. Okay. And you know, the, 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 the theme of those killing Jews on the way was that if we are making our way to the land of Israel, to uproot non-believers, non-believers in Yashke, why wait all the way to get to Israel to wipe out the, the infidels, the, the Muslims who don't believe in Christ? We could do it on the way already. So this was a religious, and this is the first time that we get the, 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 the complete wrath of the Christian faith, a very, very brutal faith, right? A faith that has its, its roots in anti-Semitism, right, Christianity. And uh, yes, we're getting now a more a pleasant version, perhaps by some, but we Jews should never forget uh, history. And I, I mentioned this every single year, 
because I think it's important that when uh, Cloud Lundsman made his uh, 11, 12 hour movie Shoah, maybe it's longer, maybe it's 18 hours. I don't know how many hours it is. But he made his movie Shoah and he interviewed, I think it was in the early 70s, many, many people in Polish towns that had Jews and no longer have Jews. And he even interviewed people in Auschwitz, in the town that is a kilometer and a half away from Auschwitz. And if you're interviewing people in, 19, in the early 1970s, it's basically 30 years after the war. So the vast majority of older adults were there. And what did they do, right? And in, in one of the scenes I remember, I think was like in a bar, I, I saw probably 20 years ago or 30 years ago, maybe. I saw, I remember one of the scenes that there was a person that he started asking questions and there was an indication that he felt uncomfortable. And what struck me the most, and I, it was 1990, I remember now that we got it in the Byte Library, 1990 I saw it. What struck me most was the fact that he interviewed some local in Oshwin. And he asked the local, what's your thought about what the Nazis did to the Jews? So he said the following, number one, we didn't do anything. It wasn't the Poles. It wasn't the Poles. It was the Nazis. So we couldn't do anything. They controlled us. And that's the Polish way of thinking, even today, right? That, yeah, we were occupied by the Nazis and we, we had nothing to do with it, right? Which, if you know a little bit about uh, the history, you know that that's not true. I remember having conversations with uh, Adam Furstenberg of Shalom about this. And he had, a, he had a tremendous amount of information. What a bubba mice it is with the Poles and the uh, Lithuanians and what the Ukrainians say and what the Hungarians say, right? That had nothing to do with it. But what he did say was the locals said, listen, we didn't do anything, but the truth is the Jews did deserve it. The Jews, the Jews deserve being sent into gas chambers. Why, explains that local Polish Gentile. After all, they killed uh, Yeshu, you know, they killed JC, so, you know, so we killed JC 2,000 years ago, so we deserve it. Yeah, so that's the, the history of what Christianity transmits to the next generation. So let's just be mindful of it, mindful of it, of what it caused us, right? Of recorded events and events that are not recorded, the blood libels that we had to deal with, right? The history is full, full of it. And when we talk about the first crusade, let's talk about the second crusade as well. What happened in, in France, I think the city of Blois in 1171, where, uh, you know, they, they made up a Baba Misa about a Jew killing a Gentile and they wiped out the community there. They killed many people there as well, 1171. The date that that occurred was on the 20th of Sivan. And in some rabbinic circles, they had already a tradition that this is a sad day. But as we'll see later, the 20th of Sivan got a new, unfortunately, a new life due to the loss of life in the 17th century. But now we're focusing on these communities that were hubs of Torah. And I'll let you read it, right? Me, Ten Roshimaim, Eni Mekor Nozlai. FK call you Mosai, I'll cry on what happened in those communities. Spires, ah, spires, worms, and mines. Back in a second. Okay.
There's one, you know, we have a, a tradition of singing it a little bit, right? And that's Lamed Aleph, Lamed Aleph. We've done it here every year. And it is uh, comparing and contrasting Yitzias Mitzrayim to Yitzias Yerushalayim. So it's Lamed Aleph. We'll do that and then we'll move on to the uh, other, to the other kinos to talk about our history. So if you have Lamed Aleph, it starts with the words Eish Tukat. Eish Tukat Bekirbi Behalosi Alihibi Betzeisi Mimitzrayim Lanomrarim, <laughs> Becherem letusha, letevach letusha, betsaisim Yerushalayim. Zevach umincha, veshemen amishcha, betsaisim imitzrayim. Zbulase lekocha, katsa letivcha, betsaisim Yerushalayim. Chahagim veshabasos, umopsim veyalsos, betsaisim imitzrayim. Tanis v'yevel urda forever b'tzeisim Yerushalayim tohavu aholim ne'arba degolim b'tzeisim imitzrayim ve'alei shmoelim u'machanol sareilim b'tzeisim Yerushalayim yahovel u'shmita. Ve'eret shoketo b'tzeisim imitzrayim Machor l'tzmesos v'choros v'chosos b'tzeisim Yerushalayim Kahapores v'aron v'avnei zikaron b'tzeisim imitzrayim Ve'avnei ha'kela u'chlei ha'bola b'tzeisim Yerushalayim Ve'evim v'aronim v'shivim z'keinim b'tzeisim imitzrayim Noksim u'monim u'mochrim v'kohonim b'tzeisim Yerushalayim Mohol she'ireno Ve'aharon yancheno b'tzeisim imitzrayim Nebuchad netzar ve'andrianos keisar b'tzeisim Yerushalayim Na'aroch milchomo ve'adonai shomo b'tzeisim imitzrayim Rochak mimeno vehineineno b'tzeisim Yerushalayim Si hisrei paroches vesidrei mareches b'tzeisim imitzrayim Chemo niteches ve'olai sochches b'tzeisim Yerushalayim Oholo uzvochim Ve'ishei nichochim b'tzeisim imitzrayim Ve'cherev medukorim b'nei tzion ha'ikorim B'tzeisim Yerushalayim pa'harei mikbos 
Well, well, let's just, it's, it's appropriate always to remember Yehuda Alevi, right? How can we not remember Yehuda Alevi, his love for Eretz Yisrael? So Lamed Vav, 36, are the famous words of Sion, Halo si shali lishlam asiraich, right? So this is your Yehuda Alevi saying, listen, listen here. It, it's not just that we Jews should be asking about the welfare of Yerushalayim. It's not just about we Jews yearning to get back. It is Yerushalayim yearning that we come back. And you, Yerushalayim, Halo ti shali lishlam asiraich. Those of us who are in the Golos, those are us who are not able to, to go there, right, and connect spiritually, Yerushalayim should be crying out. Because you know who we are? We Jews are Dorshei Shlomech. We're always asking about the wealth of Yerushalayim. We've been davening for 2,000 years. So if we're always thinking about Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim should think about us. In Behem Yeser Adoraych, we are the rest of the flock. And we're not talking just about a physical return to Yerushalayim. You know, we mentioned that, although according to uh, Talmudic literature, when someone sees Yerushalayim in a state of churban, you're supposed to do a kriya, you rend your garments. It's nothing to do with the location of the temple. Meaning, even if you see Yerushalayim before you see the temple, you have to do kriya. Uh, the Talmud talks about a situation where a person first seizes the temple, and then sees Yerushalayim. And scenario number two is first sees Yerushalayim and then sees the temple. And Maimonides, Rambam explains that if you come to Yerushalayim from Jordan, right? if you come from the east, you're going to first see the temple and then Yerushalayim. So therefore, your first Kriya is on the temple, on the Beis Hamikdash. If on the other hand, you come from the west, you come from Yafo, when you come from Yafo, the first thing you see is not the temple mount. The first thing you see is the old city. Rashi, on the other hand, explains that the scenario where you first see the temple is if a person was brought into Yerushalayim in a box. If you're placed in a box and you come out of the box, you know, you, maybe you have to use a handle and you pop out of the box and you see the Beis Amigdash, that's the only scenario you could see Beis Amigdash before Yerushalayim. In other words, you, Rashi had a vision of Yerushalayim that the Beis Hamikdash was in the middle of the city, and the city surrounded it. And it's impossible, according to Rashi, to first see the temple before the Yerushalayim unless you were brought into the city in a box. And Rambam, who had the privilege of seeing Yerushalayim, understood the layout. And Rashi, who did not have the merit, did not see it. So we have to feel privileged that we could see Yerushalayim today. 
And we have to feel privileged that in the words of Ramosha Feinstein, Yerushalayim today, the city is Bnuya Letiferetz. It's a built city. We no longer have to mourn the physical. It is the spiritual that is sad. And if you think about the Temple Mount, right, we use the words Har Habayit Biyadenu. Thank you, Rabbi Shalom, for the Six Day War. But the last time I looked, there's still a presence that's not us, right? And it's, they don't belong there. Today, it's not politically correct to say they don't belong there. But the fact is, we have a record of a Beis Amikdash that was there. We were kicked out and we never lost hope. And we've been davening every single one of us for 2,000 years. So the, they have, the Muslims have zero right over the location. Right? It's a fact. It's something that anyone with the, with, with the glata cup, anyone that has the ability to think and knows a little bit of history knows that they don't belong there. Right? And, you know, reality is our reality, but it obviously gives us what to daven for. We daven for a return that's physical. Right? And by the way, when you're going to say Nachem, today in the afternoon in Mincha, and you're going to say that Yerushalayim is a, a city that's, that's desolate. Right? You're going to use those very you know, strong words about the state of Yerushalayim, right? To read from the Nachem prayer that we say in the afternoon, you know, Rabban Shalom, Nachem, have, have, give comfort to Yerushalayim because it is a city that is Avela. It's an Avela, it's in mourning. It's Chareva, it's Charev. Ubzuya, it's Bazui, it's shameful. Vishomemon, it's desolate. And obviously, when you read it, you think, wait, what do you mean desolate? Do you know how much real estate costs in Yerushalayim? Right? It's not desolate. Baruch Hashem, we've merited to see traffic in Yerushalayim. Baruch Hashem. It's, Hashem. it's only going to grow. So why are we labeling it a city that's charevab, zuyan, shomema? So what you should think then is about the Temple Mount. Think about the Temple Mount. And if you want, you could expand it even into the Arab quarters. And obviously we treat every single human being with dignity, right? And we believe that, we, that every single Palestinian dream deserves to be treated with dignity. But that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be in our house, right? If someone's in my house, I can in a dignified way lead them out, right? And obviously they deserve to be compensated and bring them to Canada and we make our way to our Sisra with when the Beis Hamikdash is rebuilt and they'll feel comfortable here. So Rabbi Yehuda Halevi talks about our yearning for Yerushalayim, right? Our yearning for Yerushalayim. Sion aloti shali lishlom asiraich. That's what we are told. Miyam umizrach umitzafon veteman from all directions. Jews have been in all directions, right? Jews have been in South Africa. Jews have been in Scandinavia. Jews have been in the Far East. And Jews are in the far west, and that's us, from all corners. Shalom rachok vekarov, okay, from all of them. Se'i mikol avareich. Bring us, bring us from all corners. Ushlom asirei tikva. And, you know, go out and ask for the welfare of the people who are hoping, you know, hoping for a return. Noten dma'av kital chermon. People who cry for the Khurban, like the dew that comes down from Mount Hermon. People who are waiting to make their way to Yerushalayim. I cry for Yerushalayim like the Tanim. It's an animal that uh, seems to be making a lot of uh, 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 sounds of uh, are these foxes or look up the translation here or you could text it here but these are animals that make a cry and that's our cry for the besamikdash or jackals probably ve'et ach echlom shevat shvutech and when i when i dream about the return ani chinor leshiraich i become like a kinor i become like either a harp or a violin, but it's more of a harp for your songs. I become like a harp. I cry, I sing. Okay? So this predates Naomi Shemer. 
Livkot enutech anitanim. Oh, did I do that? No, yes. Libi lebetel. My heart is to the house of a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Velifnei oel meod yeheme. And I cry out in front of a Kodesh Baruch Hu lemachanaim lechol nigei taraych. And I cry out for your all your camps, the Machna of the Shechina of the Levia, right? All of them I cry out. Sham Hashchina Shechuna Lach. Where's the Shechina in Zion in Eretz Yisrael in Yerushalayim? The Yotzrech Posach Lemul Sharei Shachak Sharei. You know that the gates of Yerushalayim correspond to the gates of Shachak of heaven. Shachak are heavens. In Israel they call skyscrapers, gordei shchakim, goret, like scratching the shchakim. So we know that there are gates of heaven, and the gates of heaven correspond to the gates of the Beis Hamikdash. And that's why we pray for a return, for a spiritual identity, not a physical one. Uchvod Hashem levad haya me'orech. HaKadosh Baruch himself provided us the light, the light in other words, poetically, there's no need for the celestial bodies to provide for us light if we have the light of God. I choose for my soul to, to spill, to spill my heart. And that is the location where there is a spirit of God bestowed upon people, the spirit of prophecy. Prophecy comes from above and it comes to Yerushalayim. I want to make my way to that location, to Yerushalayim. At Bet Milucha, you know, Yerushalayim, you are the house of royalty. The At Kise Kvodel, you are the throne of God, Yerushalayim. The Ech Yashvu Avadim, how is it that you have slaves? Alei kisot viraich, where the kings are supposed to sit. That's basically how we should look at it. It is always, you know, I remember being once in a shul in Sfat, and they had some paintings on the ceiling, probably more modern, probably like in the past, perhaps decades, probably set maybe a century ago. And one of them is the image of the Harabait with the, with the dome, with the golden dome. The Golden Dome, although it always became for us the image of Yerushalayim, but we have to always remember whenever you see a picture of it, these are Avadim Yashvu. They don't, it doesn't belong there. It's a fact. Mi Yitzneini Meshotet, Halavai, you know, that I should have the ability to roam. Bim Komot Asher Niglu Elokim Lechozais I wish I could walk the streets of Yerushalayim, right? The location where Hakadosh Baruch Hu appeared to his, the ones who had chose, who had visions, and the ones who were his seer, his messengers. Yehuda Alevi mourns not just a return, but even to make his way to Yerushalayim. In this day and age, is something that he yearns, and therefore, for us Jews, a trip to Yerushalayim is something that's valuable, right? We mentioned in halachic literature, you know, that there's a section in Shulchan Aruch that talks about taking uh, ship rides and the halachic problems that exist. Because when you go on a ship, there's a, perhaps a, a, either a potential or an actual violation of Shabbos or a violation of the spirit of Shabbos. So we are told that halachically a person should not get on a boat on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. Don't go on a boat ride on a ship or on a cruise that leaves towards the end of the week, unless it is for a mitzvah. Now, what is considered a mitzvah? That already there is a discussion and there are different explanations. But the perfect example of a mitzvah where it is 100% permissible to get on your ship before Shabbos, meaning even Friday, is a trip to Eretz Yisrael because it's a mitzvah to go to Eretz Yisrael. Comes from Avram Gambiner, the, of the 17th century, and he notes now, don't think that it is only a mitzvah to go to Eretz Yisrael to, vi- to live there, but rather, even if you are visiting Eretz Yisrael, it's considered a mitzvah. Why? Because walking four cubits, walking four amot in Eretz Yisrael is a mitzvah. 
Eretz Yisrael is something that we yearn. Yes, we yearn for Eretz Yisrael with the building of the Beis Hamikdash, with the proper return, establishing a system the way it should be. But we also yearn any presence in Eretz Yisrael. And we view those who live in Eretz Yisrael as privileged people. It's a mitzvah. Can't deny it. I'm not saying it's easy, right? It's not always easy, you know, dealing with the bureaucracy, right? This is the Ben-Gurion uh, socialist uh, country still has its, uh, you know, government offices. This is not easy, right? We don't want to talk about it. It's Lashon Hara. But before someone jumps on the plane or, you know, jumps on a, somehow gets to Eretz Yisrael, you have to be cognizant of the fact that there are some challenges and you have to accept those challenges and go willingly. But it's a privilege. It's obviously a privilege to be in Eretz Yisrael. And the fact that we have Baruch Hashem, the ability to live there in a Jewish state, we've got to say thank you, Rabbanu Shalom, for that opportunity. Because Yehuda Alevi would have been very happy to even walk the streets where the prophets walked. Okay? And he asks, Yehuda Alevi says, I wish I would have wings that I could fly. He wished to get on a plane. So do I, by the way. But uh, he wishes that there would be a mechanism to get him a, we- a mechanism. Yehuda Alevi wished that there would be a mechanism with wings to get him to Israel. Okay? I need le bisri le vavi ben psaraich. In other words, I will go ahead and, and, and shake my heart because I will have this deep desire to reach far in my travels, to reach Eretz Yisrael and mourn there. Epol le'api alei artsa. In other words, when I reach the land, I will fall to my face. Have you ever seen pictures of people getting off the El Al plane, Nefesh Benefesh, and you kiss the ground? The Yemeni Jews, some of them did it. European Jews uh, did it. Kissing the ground was something that Yehuda Levi talks about, and it's in the Talmud as well, by the way. But he says, I will fall to my face to kiss the ground. I will love the stones tremendously. And even when it comes to the soil and to the dirt of the land, it is something that will be chen, will be pleasant to me. When you walk, if you have the privilege, if we get the privilege of making our way to Eretz Yisrael, even for a visit, even for a visit, we're going to look at the soil and the stones and say, ah, it's from Eretz Yisrael. I know people that when they come back from Israel, they took stones. I think I remember on the trip 10 years ago, 10 years ago on the Shul trip, it was nine and a half years ago, I think uh, I remember someone picking up some stones and then they inspired me to pick up some nice stones. I think they put on the matzeva of a parrot, if I remember correctly. Okay, and then what else is there in Eretz Yisrael? Says Yehuda Levi, Af ki be'amdi alei kivrot avotai. How much more so do I have the desire to stand by kivrei avos in Hebron? Ve'eshtomem alei Hebron, and I shall cry about Hebron. You can still cry about Hebron today, by the way. Mivchar kivaraich, which is the highest category, the bachur, the chosen location for graves. What other places in Israel do you miss on Tisha B'Av? Next. Har Ha'avarim, the Hor Ha'har. He commemorates the two mountains where Moshe and Aaron were buried. Asher Sham Shnei Orim Gedolim Me'oraich Umoraich. The great lights and teachers were buried. Jordan, by the way, historically was part of Israel. Right? Don't tell Hussein. But uh, it was part of Israel. Everayarda and the tribes of Reuven, God, were settled there. Menashe and the Golan, obviously. You should know that the soul, the soul gets life and sustenance from the air, air in Eretz Yisrael. It's sustenance, right? You go there, you feel uplifted. You see what they're achieving, right? You see what they're doing. You see what they're building. You see the attitude by many. You interact with people that have far, more, far less than many people here, but are much happier and feel satisfaction. It uplifts the spirits. Chayei neshamot avir atzech. Umimar dror avkat afaraich. In other words, from the highest type of spices, mar dror, mar dror was considered the highest of all spices. 
you should know that your dirt, the dirt of the land is more valuable than all that. The nofes tzuf, and you should know that the, la- the waters of Eretz Yisrael, the naharaich, are sweeter to me than honey. The waters of Eretz Yisrael. So when you get to Eretz Yisrael, and you buy mei eden, or nevayot, the two water bottle, and drink a lot, you have to remember that you're supposed to say over and over again that the waters of Eretz Yisrael are so much better than the bottles you could buy at no frills. Even though no frills are cheaper, the fact is it's Eretz Yisrael water. You should feel that attachment to the land. Yin'am lenafshi. It will be pleasant for my soul. Haloch arom veyechef. To go with torn clothes and barefoot. Alei charvot shmama. Even on the locations of desolation and destruction, even without shoes, it's pleasant for me. Asher Hayad Virach, which once upon a time was your holy location. To walk through those streets where there was holiness of the past is something I want to do even if I'm barefoot. Bimkom Aronech, in the location of where your holy ark was. Asher Nignaz, that was concealed, you know, by who? By Yoshio, by the way. Uvim kom to walk by the location where the Kerubim were, asher shachnu chadre chadareich, which dwelt room within room. Okay. Egoz ve'ashlich pe'er nezer. I tear out my hair like a mourner. Ve'ekob zman, and I curse the day. Chilel be'eretz bavel et nezireich. Right? that was cursed in the land of Babylonia, your holy people. How can food be sweet to me, right? And Arev is like something that's sweet. How can food be sweet to me? At the time that I see, when I see the dogs, the dogs, and it's referring to nations here, Dragging our children, right? Oh, ech meor yom ye matoklina. How can the brightness of the day be sweet to me? Beod ere befi orim or vim. When I see in the mouth of the ravens, pigreb saraich, the flesh of the dead bodies. And obviously, he has images that are described by your meow. Images that are described by the Midrashim about the Churban. The, 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 the pouring of this cup of sorrow should be slowly. Wait a little bit. I've had too much bitterness. Too much bitterness. When I remember. Right? When I remember what was happening in Shomron, that they rejected God and they drank wine of anger that angered the wrath of God. Veskora Aliban, I'm going to remember Yerushalayim. Ahaliba is Yerushalayim because the Ohel, the tent of God, was in it. Veemset Shmaraich, I shall drink even the dregs of those holy things, because Zion is Klilat Yof. You know, Zion includes all beauty. Ahava Vechen. Oreri limeod. Strengthen yourself with love and beauty. Uvach nikshu nafshot chaveraich. Because those who love you, the righteous people, right, we are connected to you deeply. Hem, now by the way, hem, these righteous people are smechim leshalvatech va koavim al shamuatech ubochim al shvaraich. So anyway, we read with the majority here, and we have other things. I'll, I'll give you a minute or two to complete it, and then I'll move on uh, to a few other points of history. Okay, Kina 41. Kina 41. This is a significant one. Sha'alis Rufa Ba'esh. What is Sha'alis Rufa Ba'esh about? Well, 
We're going to have to go to France to appreciate uh, the depth of Sha'ali Srufa Ba'ish. And what's happening is, is that there's a, a great yeshiva in Paris, a big, significant yeshiva of Torah scholars, led by a Rosh Yeshiva by the name of Rabbi Yechiel, Rabbi Yechiel mi Paris. Rabbi Yechiel of Paris inspires students, teaches Torah, and when we talk about the Ba'alei HaTosfot, when you open a, da- a page of Talmud, and you see the Tosfot, and you see them quoting Rabbi Nutam and Rabbi Nu Yitzchak and Ria Zaken and Rabbi Shul, all these great rabbis, they established these yeshivot and they lived on in France. And the development of these tremendous institutions that studied Talmud in depth and brought Talmud together. In other words, while in the past Talmud was a text that was known, no one ever had the attempt that felt that everything should come together, that there should be no contradictions from one section of the Talmud to another, until these schools of the Ba'alei HaTosfot, incredible contribution to, to Torah and to our essence. Rabbi Yechiel has a the students, has a student. His student, was a, was, his name was Nicolin, Nicolin. And Nicolin Donin, walked away from tradition and seemed to be quite problematic with his behavior where he was distant from the community eventually. And Nicolin Donin eventually confer, uh, converts to Christianity and you know, was an apostate to the Christian faith. The problem was that Nicolin was, or Nicolas, according to other sources, was actually extremely knowledgeable in Talmud. And by having his knowledge and his new faith, he was a big troublemaker. He recorded 35 accusations against the Talmud. Some of them were things that appear absurd in the Talmud. And as I was, when we study Talmud, we know very well that there's a small percentage of things that are metaphors. And therefore, we don't truly appreciate and understand the message, but we look at the big picture of the Talmud as a text that has basically given us our life, our spiritual life. But Nicolais, like a good worker for the press, only focused on things that appeared negative, and he compiled 35 of them. And some of them were negative statements about the Christian faith and the one who is considered the founder of the faith. You know that there's a statement in the Talmud that Yeshu, Yeshu was burnt in boiled excrement. Doesn't sound pleasant. And obviously not something we want our, we're not going to put that on the billboard of the shul, right? JC burns in excrement, right? We're not going to do that because obviously it's a message for us to remain righteous, to remain committed to a path. The last thing we want is the church to find out. But Mr. Donin Nicolas records such, such statements and he travels to Rome. He travels to Rome and he shares it with the Pope. And the Pope, it, it, it was, they were curious with it because the way they viewed, the way Christianity viewed the Jewish faith up until that point was a faith based on the Bible. So for them, it was surprised that this text is what guides us. And when what was presented to them was only the ne- some things that were negative, at least from their perspective, the Pope decided that this is a text that has to be burnt. And, no, you know, in, in France, it took time, but eventually in 1242, and according to some, that this occurred in front of Notre Dame Cathedral, 24 carts of Talmud, which according to some sources, these were 10,000 manuscripts. 10,000 manuscripts before the printing press is basically all of the Talmud and all literature of all libraries. And you can only imagine what we lost. Midrashim that we lost. 
rabbinic insights, works of the Torah. It is unreal to think of what we lost on that one day of Tammuz, on the Erev Shabbos in Tammuz in 1242, because of Nicolas Donin. Now, there was a rabbi, his name was Rabion of Girondi, who actually blamed himself a little bit for it because he was one who fought against the works of Maimonides of the Rambam. And the works of Maimonides was burnt, and he saw it as a punishment for mistreating Rambam. And Rabbeinu Yonah wants us to walk away from that event, yes, to remember the brutality of the faith that burnt the books, but at the same time, for us to focus on our self-improvement, of being tolerant of a different view, right? Someone that's a little bit more strict is still a good Jew. Someone that's a little bit more lenient is, of course, also a very good Jew, right? You can have, it is okay if some Jews are Haredi and some Jews are Mizrahi. They're all making a contribution, right? But those that reject others, that's our problem, right? Those who reject, those that look down at someone that has a different kippah, that's when we have a problem. And that's what we have to work on on our Tisha B'av, right? That's what Rabbi Yonah wants us, not just to study the history and point fingers at the brutality of members of a specific faith and brutal they were, but rather to focus on areas of us to become a little bit more tolerant, right? And not believe everything we read in the media about specific groups and realize what a contribution many, 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 many are making of all kinds of different colors within our nation. And hopefully that achdus is that key ingredient that we need to get our act together. That's what he wants us to do. This kina that we are going to read, Sha'ali Srufa Be'esh, and again, it's based on the same way Yehuda Alevi turns towards Jerusalem and says, hey, hey, Jerusalem, think about the Jews that want to get back to you. So too, the author here is turning to the books, to Torah. And he says, you Torah, you Torah, which was burned. Torah was burned, basically, because Torah is studying oral tradition. If they lost 99% of their manuscripts, chas v'shol, imagine if 99% of what we lose today, you know, of works, chas v'shol, like, think about it. It's a churban. And therefore, he turns to the Torah and he says, Sha'ali, you Torah, you, the srufa ba'esh, lishlama velaich. It's time for you to start asking, how are we managing without the text, without the scrolls? Hamitavim shechon. You know what we Jews are, are, are yearning for? To dwell in Bachatzar, in the courtyard of Zvulaich and the Beis Merish. The Beis Merish is lost. You know, that's something we feel today too. Yeshivot are closed. Institutions, schools, right? It, it, the world came to an end in some ways, right? The unknown and the concern, what happened in September, right? Well, we, we, we feel a little bit of that Shavas that occurs, but we are reading the words now of Rabbi Mayor of Rutenberg, Rabbi Mayor of Rutenberg. And he is the one that was present as they burned these texts, right? As they burned the Talmud in 1242. And by the way, the, the, it was Pope Gregory, it was Pope Gregory who decreed that the Talmud needs to be burned. And the King of France who approved was Louis, I think it was the ninth, it's Louis the ninth. And he was also known as St. Louis. The next time you travel and you see St. Louis, please remember. Now, Rabbi Mayer of Rutenberg, by, him, by the way, he himself, years later, right, he noticed this in 1242. He became the leader of German Jewry. He was a young man at the time in his 20s. He became the leader of German Jewry. But unfortunately, the anti-Semitism only increased. And Rudolf I, as he returned to Germany, Rudolf I declared that Jews were the slaves of the treasury. And therefore, when in 1286, this Rabbi Mayer of Rutenberg, right, some 44 years after seeing the Talmud being burnt, he was captured by German authorities. And he was trying to make his way to, to Italy, and he was put in prison. 
and there was a ransom of 23,000 pounds of silver. But due to the fact that he was the leader of all German and French Jewry, they were able to collect the money. However, there was a problem because the Talmud tells us that you're not supposed to free captives for a price that is not the norm. And Rabbi Meir Rutenberg Paskin that you're not allowed to release me, meaning he Paskin that halachically, he's not allowed to leave prison. And he died there. And he, was only, and he died in 1293, and his remains were only buried in 1307. And their matzevas from Maram and Rutenberg are still present in Worms. I think David Wolf was uh, there, others perhaps as well. So it's Maram and Rutenberg who wrote this Shali Strufa Baesh. He is the one that wrote, and he makes reference to the fact, Hayesh Torah Chadosha. There's no new Torah, Hashem. So why did you allow our Torah? To be burnt. I'll, I'll let you read this Shali Sufa Me'esh, and then we'll cover briefly some other historical facts before we move on. So please uh, read it. Okay, we talked, uh, you could continue or you could listen. We talked early a little bit about the 20th of Sivan, that it was established as a day of mourning due to the events of 1171. But they came back to life in the 17th century. On the 20th of Sivan, in 1648, in the city of Nemirev in the Ukraine, the Kozaks, the, there was the Kozak rebellion by the Ukrainians trying to shake off the authority of the Polish noblemen. And these brutal Ukrainian Kozaks led by Khamnitsky, Bogdan Khamnitsky, they arrive in the city of Nemirev and they kill there about 6,000 people. Among those killed was the leader of the community, Rabbi Chiel Michel. And the brutality was such that when the word got out of the tremendous Hurban, rabbis felt that it's proper to reestablish the 20th of Sivan as a day of mourning. Okay? And this is something that Rabbi Shapsi Cohen, who was the great rabbi at the time, uh, the author of the Shach, he writes that I established for myself and my future generations that on the 20th of Sivan, I'm going to say Kinos to commemorate number one, the destruction of 1171, and number two, the destruction that occurred during this period of time. And if we would visit Europe, uh, European communities up until the war, there were still those that commemorate the 20th of Sivan. Obviously, after the tremendous, uh, the Shoah, it's a date that vanished, and therefore it's important for us on every single Tisha B'av to commemorate all these events. Because although other dates perhaps cannot be observed, we're going to stick to Tisha B'av until we merit the building of the Beis HaMikdash. And Tisha B'av is here, and therefore we remember the Shoah and the brutality of, of the Shoah. And uh, some time ago, I remember watching some footage from Lvov, from Lemberg. And there's footage there from 1941 as the Nazis marched in, in June or July, in the summer of 1941. And a little bit of the brutality you see on film. And it's painful for two reasons. Number one, because you see what kind of animals they were. And often it was the Germans allowing the locals to do what they desire. But the worst part is, is that you realize that what you are watching is far from the worst of what was done. Far from the worst. And to think that there are people that went through it and somehow were able to move on, at least operate as if they moved on, 
is quite quite incredible and it's supernatural and it's supernatural and we remember the kedoshim and remember that we as Jews know that we are where we don't belong we don't belong in a state of golos we don't belong in a state that we don't have that structure that inspires ourselves and humanity and every little bit that we do counts right commemorating this day counts and obviously self-improvement counts right jewish unity and uh, there's a lot of focus on lush and hara to be careful what we talk about others it's an area that it's very tempting but we have to be careful what we talk you know i'm as uh, we, we we've all been talked about right and we all unfortunately have talked and we've all listened and we want to put an end to all three of those right no one wants to be talked about no one should be talking lush and hara we all unfortunately have failed in that area and obviously we have to not listen as well because if there's no audience right if no one turns into to to the broadcaster the broadcaster is out of business that's what our tish above is about we have the tradition of standing if possible for the last kina which is mem hey and we're going to go ahead and uh, sing it as we have traditionally so i'm going to go ahead and move this and, uh, not sure exactly this is the best way to do it but uh here we go it's a lithium a lithium
I thank everyone for participating. It should be a meaningful uh, Tisha B'Av. We should merit the Gula. Please, there are a lot of online. There are many opportunities online. You go to the Yeshiva World or Matzev.com and you can find many, many different videos or YouTube videos. And we should utilize uh, this day, utilize this day uh, to go ahead and think about the past and hopefully make a better, better future. So we should talk to all of you. Shukach, Rabbi. Okay. Shukach, Rabbi. Shukach to you. Shukach. Okay, should be a meaningful Tishavav, and everyone stay safe, please. Okay. All right. Here we go. Good. What did you?